and welcome to Hadi TV and another episode of Beyond Belief. Alhamdulillah, we've been able to uh, speak extensively about a fundamental uh, issue that we face in our society as far as our ideological challenges that we have, and that is God, providence, wisdom, justice, and the problem of evil. And we looked at it from an, an outside perspective and tried to tackle this issue from the different angles and hopefully be able to add a little bit and contribute a little bit to the establishing of some kind of general realization that we really need to put effort in the progressing and in the advancing of our ideological belief. In so many places in the Holy Quran, it instructs us, it gives us the order of trying to instill that element of faith in our hearts. Even in some places it says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, aminu. O you who believe, believe. Or the other famous Quran, uh, verse in the Holy Quran that says, don't say that you have uh, left, le, le, reached a level of faith, say that you have submitted yourself, but uh, until faith enters into your heart, that's another stage altogether. Now, why do we need to say this? Because we realize, we understand that there are still a lot of challenges that we face in our lives. And these obstacles, if we don't bring about a good, strong theological foundation in our lives, we will see many flaws popping up here and there. We won't have that full, complete puzzle um, with all of its pieces laid in the correct place. You know, there will be little uh, pockets here and there of issues that we are going to have to deal with. And maybe these small uh, holes or patches, if they're not mended, if they're not uh, dealt with, then they could expand and expand and expand. That's why it's very important for us when we do come across a question or a misconception or a criticism, then we, we deal with it. It's very similar to you having a little cut on your finger. If you put some antiseptic on it, if you cover it with a band-aid, then um, you'll be cured, inshallah. However, if you allow it to get infected and the infection spreads and spreads, you'll probably have to amputate your arm, for example. So we need to make sure that we are quick in dealing with these particular issues, whatever they may be. Alhamdulillah, in this particular era that we are in, there's so much advancement and technology and uh, information being uh, shared everywhere. So we have access to all of these things. On the downside, we can see that this modern world is distancing itself away from the muqaddas, from the sacred, from that which we see to be a part of our human slash religious slash moral 
history and heritage. And so these are a part of the challenges, you know, when you come across certain debates and discussions that are happening in the Western world or in the Eastern world, you know, or uh, certain times, unfortunately, you might even see some kind of cultural imposing on the weaker civilization or an invasion into trying to uh, dictate onto you what kind of way of thinking or what is right and what is wrong instead of you realizing what is correct and what is incorrect. And that's why in this episode we're going to be speaking about three very fundamental elements, three factors that we need to perfect, that we need to be the best at, especially with our youth, especially with uh, teenagers and young adults where they're just about to enter into university or you are in university or you have finished from university. You're intrigued by spirituality and religion and intellectual uh, discussions and motivated talks and thinking in a critical way this is the kind of thing that we really need to focus on. And these three factors, these three elements, which will pretty much lay down a strong foundation for every individual. The first is epistemology. And we have spoken a little bit about epistemology in the previous episodes. Epistemology basically means the theory of knowledge, the theory of justification, of knowledge. How am I able to confidently rely on the piece of information that I have, which I have acquired through different types and different ways, whether it be sensual knowledge, whether it be rational knowledge, inf uh, or things like that. This word of justification in how I perceive things is the topic that epistemology uh, deals with. Now, why do I need to know this? Because, which inshallah we're going to be speaking about this, when it comes to how you are able to be confident enough to say that what you believe in is the truth and the absolute truth. Or, in other words, do you even have a right? Are you even entitled to say that you believe in the absolute truth? and that you hold what is truly the real religion. Or no one is entitled to that because every person has a portion of truth, a portion of reality. This exclusivity that you claim that you have, how are you able to justify it? How are you able to prove it? Is there such thing as absolutism or is everything relative. Now, this is things, these are things that are discussed in epistemology and mashallah Islam has a wonderful outlook on epistemology and we can see that even though this could be a relatively new uh, science that hasn't uh, been around for a long time in its independent kind of system, but we can see that we are able to uh, deduce epistemological foundations from our religious heritage. The second is worldview and having a worldview, obtaining a correct worldview. And the third is an ideology. Now, of course, inshallah, in this program, I'm going to try to uh, deal with worldview and ideology. And whenever I do uh, mention in our program here, Beyond Belief, whenever I mention epistemology or epistemic or perception or understanding or justification of knowledge, please remember that this is the fundamental grounding that we are, are using for everything that we are dealing with. Something that we as Muslims, 
need to be very proud of is that Islam is a reason-based religion, which means that thing that ignites your curiosity, that thing that uh, initiates your journey, that thing that starts your very process into looking for a religion and accepting or rejecting things based on what choice of religion one makes is reason itself, is the aql and ta'aql. Why did we mention in a previous episode that Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's first creation was al-aql, was reason and intellect? And that that is what we are going to be held accountable for. That is how we are going to be judged by our aql, by our intellect. Where through our reason and through our rationality, we either accept the precepts of a particular ideology or religion or, or a worldview, or we reject. If something does not conform with my intellectual rationality, then I shouldn't accept it. And this is the beauty of Islam, where Islam says the first thing that you need to focus on is your reason, is rationality. And that's what Usul al-Din is. And you know, my dear brothers and sisters, that it is haram. You are not allowed to do taqlid or imitate or emulate or follow issues in Usul al-Din, in the foundations and the fundamentals of your belief. You cannot say, well, I believe that God exists and that God is one because I was born into a Muslim family. You cannot say that. You need to have your level of proof and evidence. No, it doesn't need to be deep, detailed, philosophical arguments with too many uh, terminology that you probably don't even understand on a high expertise level. No, it doesn't need to be that. It can be as simple as what you understand proving and establishing the existence of God to be. But again, as I said in the beginning of this program, you need to put effort, you need to invest, you need to make sure that you are giving it its due haq as far as your faith and reason is concerned. And therefore, when you come around to this level of saying, well, I am confident, I am proud, I am strong enough to say that I have adopted this kind of worldview, this kind of epistemology, and I haven't explained what worldview is, but I will, based on my re rational understanding, based on me using my pure intellect, which hasn't been influenced by anything here or there. And this is where, when you say that th as a believer in the monotheistic religion and as a believer in the oneness and uniqueness of Almighty God, you can pr proudly say that this has been established through using intellect and reason and nothing else. And that's what learning what your usul al deen is all about. Of course, when you enter into the realm of furu al deen or the branches of religion like your acts of worship and the sharia, and rules and regulations, that's another issue uh, on its own. A worldview, in Arabic, it's called Ru'ya Kawniya, and in Persian, it's called Jahan Bini. Jahan means world, and Bini means the way you see the world. Ru'ya is the same. Ru'ya means your way of seeing. Kawniya, Kawn means the universe. So your, your take, your particular observation, your particular understanding on how you see this world, how you see your human relation with the world, with creation, how you see your relationship with humanity, how you see your relationship 
with society. What your ontological understanding is of existence and society and your purpose and these kind of things. This is what worldview means. And of course, Islam has a lot to say about what a worldview should mean and what it should lead to. In particular, the issue of making us aware of our duty on this earth. In particular, making us understand that we are not here for vanity. We are not here for pleasure. We are not here for amusement only. We are not here just as a filling of a place on this earth. But there is a purpose for us. That we came from somewhere and that we will be going somewhere and that we are here for something. These are, of course, very important things that we need to instill in our minds and our hearts. And that's what adopting a correct worldview means. So, as I said, number one is epistemology. Gathering epistemic understanding of how you are able to rely on your knowledge. Basically, epistemology means the philosophy of knowledge or the knowledge of knowledge, ilm al ilm, if we can say. Uh, then, of course, it's me and my understanding of how I am able to deal with a worldview, how I am able to adopt some kind of universal understanding of what humanity is, what existence is, what the human relationship with humanity and existence and society is. That kind of understanding is what we uh, refer to as a worldview. Just going to go for a short break and we will be back very, very soon. <laughs> وجدتك أنت يا ربي منايا وحلو أفكاري ألذ مشاربي أخلو بهمهمتي وإسراري ويسكرني عن الدنيا دعائي وقت أسحاري أيا حنان يا منان يا رحمن يا با لقاؤك غايتي يا رب فيه كنز النوار إليك أبث ما تجري. Welcome back, dear brothers and sisters, and we left off before the break speaking about a world view and adopting a world view, and what is the Islamic take on. A worldview. Uh, we can see that the first and foremost thing that we are able to uh, derive from our understanding of a unique Islamic worldview is that besides the fact that a human being has a purpose on this earth and they came from somewhere and they will be going somewhere, there's also the issue of the rational side of the human being. And that our purpose here on this earth is to reach our full potential on an intellectual level. When you emphasize so much on the seeking of knowledge and trying to make sure that this knowledge that you have is unadulterated knowledge, pure knowledge, and also that this knowledge is also going to benefit you in two ways. In this dunya we weigh here in this, on this earth and also 
in the hereafter, in the afterlife, in the akhirah. Now, the worldview is going to be based on not you being the axle or the pivot of creation, but God being the basis and foundation. And that's where your understanding as a practicing Muslim is fulfilled through your uh, observation of how a worldview is to be. Carrying on in regards to an ideology, your worldview is based on your epistemic understanding of justification of knowledge and how you see knowledge to be utilized in such a way where you are able to rely on the pieces of information that you have. And then ideology, your ideology, which is a set of beliefs, a set of do's and don'ts and must and must nots and should and should nots. That is laid down on the worldview. So as we said, it's epistemology, then worldview, and then comes your ideology. Or in another way, we can say that uh, an ideology, which is, as we said, a series of musts and must nots that a person uh, has, and these do's and do nots uh, pretty much build some kind of school or system or curriculum and this system is a synchronized system within the person's ideology and um, that's of course one um, definition of what ideology is another definition which is a very simple definition that some scholars have given is that ideology is religion. In order for you to have an ideology, it means you are affiliated, you adhere to a particular religion. And that religion is the basis of your ideology. Now, before we say whether this ideology is right or not, we have to know what it is that it is relying on. Because Everyone can claim that they have some kind of uh, synchronized system of do's and don'ts and must and must nots that they uh, follow. But the question is whether or not this kind of framework is based on something correct or justifiable as far as that uh, basis of knowledge is concerned. And this is why an ideology is built out of a worldview, and a worldview is, is built out of an epistemology. And we can say this in another word, we have al-hikma and nazariya which is the theoretical wisdom, and we also have al-hikma al amaliya which is practical wisdom. Your worldview is your theoretical hikma, and your ideology is your practical hikmah, al-hikmah al-amaliyah. This is what our Islamic uh, theologians speak about. And that's why your ideology kind of like becomes your identity. Which is again why it's so important for us to look into these kind of things. And alhamdulillah, I'm very sure that all of our viewers one way or another have come across these things but what we want to do is we want to categorize each and each and everyone in its proper compartments and that's what logic does logic is a way of enabling yourself to categorize things in its in its allocated correctly allocated and proper place so much so that it will give you immunity in your level of understanding that you have. As far as religion is concerned, religion assists you in your ideology. In the sense that in these ways of you seeing things, these ideas, ideal 
kind of situations that you have in how you want to interact with society. Let's remember, a human being is, as our philosophers uh, say, madaniyun bittaba, is, our, a human being is social in their nature. So humans want to interact with other people. Humans have interests that they want to share with others. They have interests that they want to receive from others. This is, of course, natural. And therefore, seeing that this is something natural and humans want to interact with other people in society and the opposite is unhealthy, which is being antisocial, then there needs to be some kind of laws set down that would cater to the interaction of society, so, so, people in society so much that it does not become chaotic. Because when you have needs in society, there might be a time where there are conflicts in the needs. You want something, someone else wants that very thing. What's going to happen here? Here comes the issue of ownership. Ownership does not need some kind of rules and regulations where if a person claims ownership to something, they are entitled to possessing it and it becoming a part of their wealth. And someone else is not able to usurp that away from this particular person. These needs rules and regulations. Now, you as a, an individual, are you yourself able to gather all of these rules and regulations for every single aspect of human life? Impossible. Even if you were the most intelligent of people, there would still be a need for you to make reference to something else or reference to somebody else. So me as an individual in my level of rationality that I have, in my intellect that I have, I cannot be able to introduce an all comprehensive system, an all comprehensive synchronized system and present it to the world and say, this is the model ideology for all human beings to follow. How about if it is collective, that a group of intellectual people, a group of rational people come together and try to do this? Again, they would not be able to do it. Because in our ideology, there are so many different elements that we are dealing with. It's not only the individual and the moral and the social and the political, but it's something way more than that. It's not only issues to do with how you, you deal with nature and how you deal with your neighbor and how do you deal with your creator. It's something even more than that. Because there are still things that have yet to be discovered in this earth. So what would be the most ideal, most comprehensive, most synchronized kind of system of ideology? The best would be that which has been introduced by the maker of humanity, the maker of the human being, the creator of mankind, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. And so, even though we might be able to come across in obtaining certain things that we are able to deal with in our society on an ideological level, which can be strongly substantiated by our worldview and epistemology, but we will still fall short 
in having that all comprehensive understanding. And that's where we need to extend our hand to religion and say, which religion will cater to all of these ideological needs? Which religion will be able to give me that complete, perfect understanding of what my uh, level of uh, existence is by my nature and how I am I'm able to interact with others as well. And that's exactly where we are able to realize that the criteria of knowing what is good, what is bad, what is evil, what is right, what is wrong, what is, for example, uh, these kind of methods of distinguishing between uh, these issues can only be done by that foundational perspective of an ideological understanding that is given to us by religion. And here, I would say that the most complete of these religions is the religion Islam. The most comprehensive when it comes to these things, especially in the realm of ideology, is Islam. Here, I'm going to share very quickly, inshallah, 10 quick points as to why I believe the Islamic ideology is so unique. Again, ideology is something that you need to accept. It cannot be something forced onto you. And that's why if your ideology is strong, it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what comes your, your way, your ideology will stay the same. It's when, unfortunately, in some cases, when a person's ideology is weak, then that will not reflect on anything that they are going to do. When you have a firm ideology, then that's also going to reflect on your amal, on your actions. Do you not remember what we just mentioned that we have al hikm al nadhariya theoretical wisdom, and al hikm al amaliya practical wisdom. And ideology is that practical side. That you acknowledge in your world view that there is a God. Here, in your ideological understanding, you say, this God needs to be thanked. We need to express our gratitude to God. How do we do this on a practical level? We devote ourselves to God five times a day. And that's the minimal. You know, uh, some, even though it's irrelevant to what we're speaking about now, but if we were to look at prayer and us building our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and us devoting some time of the day to Almighty God, we can see that the requirement from religion is the most minimal requirement. And even that, unfortunately, is a burden for some of us. Even that, unfortunately, is something that some of us lag behind or do not prioritize. These five times of prayer that we do, if we were to combine all of its time together, it wouldn't exceed more than 20 minutes or 25 minutes. Out of 24 hours in a day, we really can't spend less than half an hour in devotion to Almighty God, which ultimately it's going to, its benefit will come back to us. That's something for us, all of us, to reflect on. What are the 10 unique aspects of an Islamic ideology? Number one, very quickly, and each one of these uh, is a, an episode on its own. And I'm very sure that the viewers, inshallah, will be intrigued to want to look further into them. If you have already 
a good comprehensive understanding of it, then alhamdulillah, that's a wonderful thing. And I'm very sure most of you already do. That's why I'm just going to be mentioning them quickly. Number one, an Islamic ideology is natural in the sense that it conforms with the human instinct, with the primordial human nature, the fitrah, as we've, we, we say in the Islamic terminology. Number two, Islamic ideology encompasses all dimensions and all aspects of existence and creation and it is universal. It deals and it caters with everything. Number three, Islam is universal and complete. And even though it is universal and even though it is kamil and complete, it is still dynamic in its making sure that it uh, uh, deals with the requirements of change, of zaman, time, and makan, place. And that's the beauty of the dynamics of Islam. It, it's evolving in certain, uh, certain areas of the religion, in it evolving into the needs of each society and each time. And that's the beauty of ijtihad as well. Number four, Islam is forbearing. Islam is easy. Islam is simple. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Bu'ithtu ila shari'atil sahlatil samha. I was sent with a shari'a that is easy and forgiving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ma ja'ala alaykum fi dini min haraj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made your religion that level of hardship. Number five, Islam encourages life and living and interacting and using your greatest potential and obtaining and reaching those ambitions that you have in this life. We don't believe in monasticism or living as a hermit or a monk or secluding yourself or isolating yourself. No. Be with people, interact with people, enjoy your life, all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number six, Islam, as we said, is social. It encourages congregation and you being a part of jama'ah and congregation. Number seven, Islam promotes rights and freedom. You can choose your own job, you can choose your own spouse, you can choose what kind of land you wish to live in. You can choose what you want to study and human rights and the establishing and defending of rights is also something very, very important. Number eight, Islam and the Islamic ideology is also based on counsel and consultation and mashwara and shura. Number nine, Islam, uh, the Islamic ideology is against darar and harm and being hurtful to others. And last, which is number 10, the Islamic ideology is also an ideology that looks into the social economical side of a human being. The financing or the money side, the wealth side of a human being in a positive healthy way. Islam is against usury, riba. Islam is against bribe. Islam is against theft. Islam is against ihtikar and monopolization and monopolizing. Islam is in a religion that encourages uh, zakat and charity and almsgiving and donating and uh, all of these other things. These are pretty much uh, 10 quick, unique aspects of an Islamic ideology. Inshallah, we're going to continue on with talking about these kind of issues that are related to belief and beyond in our next episode here on Beyond Belief on Hadi TV. On behalf of myself and everyone here in the studio, please keep us in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.